Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we're going to talk about Ankylosaurus and some late updates to the new Jurassic Park movie, Jurassic Park World, and some other topics. So some news came out recently that in the Jurassic Park World movie, they are going to create a hybrid theropod. And if you remember, theropods are the family of dinosaurs that include Tyrannosaurus rex and other meat-eating dinosaurs. And they're going to combine, you know, the claws of some large predator and the skull of a T-Rex or whatever into something called Indominus rex. And there are a lot of people who are upset about this because there's such a big variety of theropods already out there, and some of them are very unique and interesting. They hit Spinosaurus in Jurassic Park 3, which is one of the more interesting ones, and obviously T-Rex and others. But there's one, for instance, called the Eutyrannus, which is covered in feathers. That's pretty interesting. And, you know, you've got Carnotaurus, who is another cool-looking theropod and just there's a lot to choose from so the fact that they're making one up is upsetting a lot of people i think it's kind of interesting it 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 fits with their idea that they're recreating dinosaurs from ancient genetics but in any event if you are disappointed by their their decision there's a hashtag going around on twitter and you'll also see it on google plus or facebook called hashtag build a better fake theropod and people are coming up with all sorts of funny things there's one where a guy put a great white shark on the front of a dinosaur with bare arms and things like that just to make a joke about what they're doing in the movie so i thought that was pretty funny the other jurassic world news which sabrina and i are both very excited about is they're making a new lego video game based on all four of the jurassic park movies that's supposed to come out in June, so... Probably after the movie comes out, Yeah, it's, it's a, all four. And they don't spoil the plot of Jurassic World that way. It's a very cute Lego T-Rex yeah. in the trailer. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good trailer. You should look it up if you're interested. And it, uh, I hope, because in some of the recent Lego games, you could play as, like, big the Hulk... Incredible Hulk and things like that. I hope you can actually play as some of the dinosaurs. That would be really fun. You may remember from the Jurassic Park movie, in the first one they talked about how they bred the dinosaurs to be lysine deficient. So the only way that they could survive was to be fed a supplement of lysine by the researchers and the scientists. And that way, if the dinosaurs ever escaped then they would all die out rather than running rampant and reproducing. But if you remember, there was the life finds a way thing that Jeff Goldblum said. So what the dinosaurs ended up doing was they started eating lysine-rich foods like soy. And it was based in science because there are these things called essential amino acids. And you may have heard of these in various quackery on TV, but... The idea is, and the fact is, that humans and other animals can only produce certain amino acids through their own uh, biology. So basically you eat food, it breaks it all down, and then you can reproduce some amino acids. But there are certain amino acids that you have to get through your diet because your food can't be broken down and recreated and synthesized into them. So in humans, lysine is actually one of these compounds so we eat soy if you eat chicken and lots of other foods you'll get the lysine out of that and they also mentioned that in jurassic park the herbivores were eating the soy and then the predators were eating the herbivores and they got the lysine that way so it's a real way to um, potentially prevent the spread of an animal you don't want obviously like in jurassic park the problem is if you make them deficient on something that they can find in nature they can just go out and eat things until they can reproduce and it's all over the main tool the scientists have used lately for these genetically modified organisms when they want to be able to kill them with a kill switch is they have something called a toxin switch that they can turn on and it'll kill the population 
but it has two problems. You have to trigger it, and then the other piece is it can mutate out. So over time, random mutation can get rid of this thing that you've coded into it, and there's no reason that they won't spread that way. So what scientists have done is they've come up with what they call genomically recoded organisms. And the idea is that they make a synthetic amino acid that can't be found in nature, and they use that inside the gene of the organism. And in that way, if you imagined in Jurassic Park, you had put an artificial amino acid in it, and they escaped. There's nothing they can eat because there's nothing in nature that has that amino acid in it, so they would just die out. So when scientists tried this in a lab, they took 100 billion cells and let them sit for 20 days in liquid, and then they checked to see how many of them escaped and survived, and they couldn't find a single one. So it seems to be very effective, and it has some other benefits too. So like I was saying with the toxin switch, it can be bred out or it can mutate out, but with the GROs, they can't mutate out because it's they build these codons right into the middle of a necessary gene. So if it loses that part of its genetic code, then it won't be able to reproduce or survive. So it's an absolutely pivotal part that they've coded in. And it turns out that bacteria actually have a lot of ways of messing with their own DNA. So as humans, we're stuck with whatever DNA we get when we're born. It's all what they call vertical gene transfer. So if you imagine the family tree of your, you know, your whole family, you get whatever your parents had, and that's it. There's nothing else you can do, and you can look at the whole tree and figure out who has whose genes and trace it all back, like on the Maury Povich show. But bacteria can do this thing they call horizontal gene transfer. So they can actually take DNA from nearby other cells, or they can eat another cell and take DNA out of it and repurpose their own DNA by shoving DNA inside of it. By that way, that's apparently, scientists are saying, how these antibiotic-resistant bacteria have been so successful. They can take DNA from other spots and they can mutate very quickly compared to how animals that depend on the vertical gene transfer are limited. So it's a very interesting technology, and I'm happy to hear that if we ever get to a Jurassic Park-type point in our scientific understanding, we'll have a good way of making sure that they can't escape and run rampant. Because even though I love dinosaurs, I don't want to live with them around me. (laughs) They're too scary. So today's dinosaur that we'll be covering is the Ankylosaurus. So Ankylosaurus is an ornithischian dinosaur, and it was a plant eater. It had shorter forelimbs than hind limbs, so its head was a little bit closer to the ground and its tail stuck up a little bit. And it was known as the cow of the Cretaceous because it was an herbivore and it was slow and it was kind of dumb. It also liked to graze. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, since its head was close to the ground, you'd imagine that it would eat kind of like a cow. It's not like a sauropod where it could get up to the upper canopy and eat all the leaves it wanted. It pretty much had to eat whatever was on the ground in front of it. The name Ankylosaurus means fused lizard because of all of its armor. Uh, it existed 68 million years ago during the late Cretaceous period, and it was first discovered by Barnum Brown in 1908 in the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. They were around 20 feet long, or the largest ones, and they weighed up to 4 tons, although they used to think they were up to 30 feet long and weighed up to 6 tons. They uh, recently dis- decided or discovered that no, they were not that big. Not as big. Paleontologists sometimes call them a living tank, though. One of the things we've mentioned earlier are these skin features called osteoderms. And basically what those are are really tough pieces of skin that stick out and protect the animal. So 
the easiest example in modern biology is an alligator. They have those rough bumps all over their body, and those are osteoderms. So if you imagine an ankylosaurus had osteoderms so big that a lot of them fused together, and some of them stuck out inches past the edge of their body, it was very heavily armored and is considered the heaviest armor ever on a living creature on Earth. You can also see, in addition to um, crocodiles, you see the sim- a similar feature on armadillos and some lizards. But they didn't only have these osteoderms on their back. They also had them on their sides. They had them on their arm or on their legs. They had little pea-sized ones so that they could still have the flexibility because you can't have them fused together on things that need to bend. And their head was super densely covered in them. In addition to the osteoderms on their head, they a lot of the species of ankylosaur had horns that stuck out of their head or their back near their head. And some of them stuck out kind of parallel to the body to protect the neck so that something like a Tyrannosaurus couldn't bite onto the neck and get a good grip. And other ones stuck up from the head or had a more, you know, display-like projection. So it was really a way to attract a mate rather than just being for armor. So to get an idea of what the armor might have felt like, it was covered in a layer of keratin, which is what you have in fingernails. So it's pretty tough stuff. Ankylosaurus also had a massive tail club that it could use to generate a large amount of force, which could potentially break the bones of another dinosaur, which would be a great defense. Yeah, and in the uh, Walking with Dinosaurs pseudo-documentary that we've mentioned earlier on BBC, there's a scene where an Ankylosaurus gets attacked by a Tyrannosaurus rex, and the Ankylosaurus hits the full-grown adult T-Rex in the leg and breaks its leg, and then the T-Rex is a goner. So even though they called them the cows of the Cretaceous, they're pretty pretty good at defending themselves. The only potential weak spot would be under its belly, so a predator would have had to flip it somehow, and it's a really squat, four-legged animal, so that would have been difficult. Yeah, there are a lot of things about the Ankylosaurus that remind me of a turtle. <laughs> so they've got that armored body. They're low to the ground. They're pretty slow. They're kind of dumb. Um, and then also their head is triangular, basically. So like a turtle, you know, it's got a, a kind of a squat head. Most of the dinosaurs, you know, had more of a snout, kind of a longer head. And things that ate fish had a very long head proportionally so that they had those good jaws for catching fish. And Ankylosaurus definitely couldn't catch fish, partly because of the shape of its head, but also the type of teeth it had were those, you know, wide, thick, grinding teeth. And they can tell by wear patterns that it would grind up its food. And it also had a really flexible tongue, which I think is amazing that paleontologists can tell this by looking at the skull. But you can tell by the skull and a, a part of the neck that the tongue wasn't attached in all the places that it could have been, so it could roll food around in its mouth to aid in the grinding and the chewing process. And then it had cheeks that weren't as muscly as you find in a mammal. They're more just for kind of keeping the food in place. They had narrow beaks at the end to help them strip leaves from plants, and their teeth were also leaf-shaped. So unlike ceratopsian and hadrosaurid dinosaurs, the ankylosaurs didn't have tooth batteries, and I don't think we've mentioned what those are before, but basically a battery of teeth is, if you imagine, a row of teeth, but they're all kind of fused together to make one big block of tooth mass, and then you have that on the bottom and the top, and you can really get some good grinding going between the two. The ankylosaurus didn't have that, so it would use its tongue to roll around the food when it was chewing it, like, you know, humans do, basically. you got to move that food around. You can't just smash it in one big side and grind it up. (laughs) So ankylosaurus had a strong sense of smell for both food and for predators. 
uh, but their top speed was only about six miles per hour because they were so heavy. So it's a good thing they were heavily armored. Hmm. Although, even if they didn't have the armor, they were so wide, they would have been hard to attack. So there are three families of Ankylosaurus, or Ankylosaurs. There's the Polycanthidae, the Norosauridae, and the Ankylosauridae. And we're really focusing on the Ankylosauridae in this podcast. Ankylosaur is part of the family Ankylosauridae. And those types of fossils have been found on every continent except for Africa. And actually one type of Ankylosaur developed armored eyelids. Uh, However, only a few full skeletons of Ankylosaurus have been found. And uh, one reason that this may be is because they lived upland in environments away from rivers and swamps that are conducive to fossilization or they may not have been as common in the ecosystem at the time the polycanthidae and the notosauridae didn't seem to have the big club tails that we see on the ankylosauridae so i definitely like the ankylosauridae better (laughs) (laughs) but Just because they didn't have a club on the end of the tail didn't necessarily mean that the tail wasn't dangerous, as we saw on the Diplodocus. And our fun fact is that Ankylosaurus could get a lot of blood up into its osteoderms, and that might have served a few different purposes. They talk about it with uh, Stegosaurus, too, in a similar way, but Ankylosaurus is our topic today. (laughs) In Ankylosaurus's case, they believe it might have helped with cooling because you can use it to um, increase your surface area, and in that way you can cool down quicker. But to me, the more interesting possible use is that it might have been able to blush because if you pump a bunch of blood through that outer layer of skin, you could change color. So there's a chance that if they're trying to impress a mate or look more fearsome or something, they could pump blood to this part of their body to the osteoderms and turn kind of pink which would be pretty awesome so that's it for this episode of i know dino if you'd like to read more about dinosaurs or see local dinosaur museums or if you're planning a road trip any dinosaur museums in the area you can go to our website i know dino.com or you can follow us on twitter at at i know dino you can go to our google plus page which is I Know Dino, or our Facebook page, which is also I Know Dino, if you're seeing a trend here. <laughs> Please join us next time when we're going to talk about Spinosaurus, which with some very interesting recent discoveries. Ding recent discoveries. Ding recent discoveries.